I've been rereading a fascinating article that has everything to do with this course and that has reminded me of something I really need to do before I complete my lectures for a course with Building Great Sentences in its title. The article by the late Robert J. Connors, a professor of English at the University of New Hampshire and an influential expert in the area of rhetoric and composition, is starkly titled The Erasure of the Sentence. And it was published in the September 2000 issue of College Composition and Communication. The bio note, which I assume was written by Professor Connors himself, ends with a tongue-in-cheek description of the author, quote, Now in his dotage he strives vainly for crumbs of dignity as he watches everything he holds dear swept into the dustbin of history, end of quote. Tongue-in-cheek? Yes. But I suspect there's more than a rueful grain or two of passive-aggressive truth in that sentiment, as Professor Connors has been detailing in his article the somewhat hard-to-explain disappearances of courses such as this one I'm offering that focus primarily on the syntax of the sentence. Early on in his essay, Connors offers this beautifully balanced sentence, summarizing developments in composition theory since the 1980s. Some elements of the older field of composition teaching became approved and burgeoned, while others were tacitly declared dead ends, lore-based and therefore uninteresting, scientistic and therefore suspect, mechanistic and therefore destructive. From that moment on, I knew I was in good hands, respecting as I do, writing that shows care in its own composition, particularly when that writing is in an essay on the ways in which we care about writing. The gist of this article is that sentence or syntax-based approaches to writing, uh, a famous example of which would be, the, would be Christensen's theory of the cumulative sentence, have pretty much died out or been driven underground despite their proven effectiveness by larger theoretical currents in composition theory and by theory-centered developments in the broader field of English studies. Since another anything but famous example of a sentence or syntax-based approach to writing instruction would be the course I am teaching at this moment, I have more than a passing interest, as should you, in what Connors has to say. Sentence-based pedagogies were much the rage when I was a graduate student in the 1970s, and Connors does a great job of describing both their rise and their subsequent fall. He divides writing instruction based on the sentence into three broad categories, starting with Christensen's advocacy of the benefits of the cumulative sentence, making Christensen a category unto himself. Significant portions of this course have been devoted to Christensen's rhetoric of the cumulative sentence, so you're already familiar with its contours. The next category Connors identifies consists of writing approaches that have at their center the rather precise imitation of sentence patterns, forms, schemes, and he mentions Edward P.J. Corbett's 1965 textbook, Classical Rhetoric for the Modern Student, as a flagship text for this approach, with Two books by Winston Weathers and Otis Winchester, their 1967 The New Strategy of Style and their 1969 Copy and Compose, as also adopting an approach to writing based largely on imitating identified forms. He also includes Weathers' 1980 book, An Alternate Style, Options in Composition, the book where Weathers developed his notion of Grammar B as a work which recommends the value of imitation. Now, in earlier lectures, I've repeatedly drawn from the new strategy of style, and later in this lecture, I'll have more to say about the Weathers notion of a somewhat transgressive grammar B. And the third category, Connors describes, consists of pedagogical approaches to writing centered on strategies for sentence combining. While my course has not specifically drawn from any codified theories of sentence combining, my discussion of the surface of the sentence as the tip of an iceberg of underlying propositions shares many of the assumptions of sentence combining 
And my invocation of that invisible God created the visible world sentence to show how propositions get combined in sentences is right out of the sentence combining playbook. Likewise, my enthusiasm for the Josephine Miles notion of the sentence as a progression of syntactic steps taken by strategies of conjunction, subordination, or adjectival modification owes much to sentence combining theory. So, while it was never my conscious attempt, I've introduced you in this course to the three primary categories of sentence-based writing instruction that are the subject of Connors' essay. And what Connors reports has a bit of the feel of a good news, bad news joke. The good news is that he cites a number of empirical studies that seem to validate the assumption that sentence-based writing pedagogies do indeed improve writing and do so rather dramatically. The bad news is that they have fallen out of fashion precisely in part because of a larger suspicion in English studies of empirical studies as anti-humanist and a suspicion that these successful teaching techniques stifle creativity, that they are not themselves located in larger theories of discourse and that they might actually be demeaning to, student ex to students with exercises far removed from actual writing situations that boil down to as mere servile copying. More bad news is that by the mid-80s, quote, the result of all these lines of criticism of syntactic methods was that they were stopped almost dead in their tracks as a research program and ceased being a popular teaching project just a little later, end of quote. The good news, however, is that Connors concludes that, quote, it really does seem that the current perception that somehow sentence rhetorics don't work exists as a massive piece of wish fulfillment, end of quote. As Connors explains, more good news in a sentence that is as carefully suspensive as his earlier sentence was balanced in other words, if people believe that research has shown that sentence rhetorics don't work, their belief exists not because the record bears it out, but because it is what people want to believe. Wow, that's a relief. I should explain that while I have a pretty solid foundation in writing pedagogy, I'm a trained writing teacher, but not a composition theorist or formal rhetorician. I go with what works for me in the writing classroom, aware of but not overly concerned with the broad cultural and sociological implications of my approach to writing sentences. Indeed, if I'm so bold as to refer to my theory of writing, it should probably be described as magpie eclectic, since like that curious bird, if I come across a bright or shiny theory or writing exercise, I bring it back to the nest of my classroom. I was in graduate school during the heady days in the 1970s when sentence-centered approaches to writing and more holistic approaches, such as those advanced by Peter Elbow and Ken McCrory, high priests of free writing, and Donald Murray, who extended our focus in composition to the revision process, seemed like they could not only coexist in the same classroom, but might even complement each other. I was in graduate school during the days when rhetorical theory, even in its most formalistic articulations, seemed compatible with the much broader concerns of discourse theory, as proposed by James Moffat and James Canavy. Indeed, one of my teachers at the University of Texas was Dr. Canavy, a noted discourse theorist who was also well-trained in, rhetor in rhetorical traditions, and above all, above all else, who was a man who simply loved to teach. To this day, Canavy's influential 1971 work, A Theory of Discourse, provides the broader context in which I think of all of my work with sentences. I mention all of this as a background for my heartfelt reminder that these lectures are investigations, interrogations, explorations, and celebrations of the sentence and of prose style. They are not meant as a verbal textbook that sets forth yet another set of guidelines or rules for good writing.
So much that is wrong with writing instruction is wrong because a single person's beliefs have somehow been elevated to ex cathedra pronouncements and passed along from teacher to teacher and from teacher to student through generation after generation without ever being challenged, without ever being tested against experience, without ever really being thought about. In these lectures, I have tried to do some serious thinking about the received truths that have so largely guided our efforts to teach writing. All of which is just to say that in these lectures, I have consistently advocated rule breaking, but I'm no grammatical or syntactical or rhetorical anarchist. While I believe there are many rules we should break, there are also many rules we should not break. The distinction can get tricky, but Edgar H. Schuster makes it much easier for us to tell which is which in his deliciously naughty book, Breaking the Rules, Liberating Writers Through Innovative Grammar Instruction. Schuster gives us a revealing history of how a very few men and a very few books have gained so much unwarranted influence and authority in the discourse of writing. He is particularly good at identifying what he calls myth rules, quote, rules that rule no one other than perhaps a handful of pop grammarians and hardened purists who look for their authority somewhere in the sky rather than here on earth, end of quote. He then proposes a simple test for deciding whether a rule deserves its authority. Here's the test. Choose a favorite writer, preferably a modern writer and preferably a nonfiction writer, then check to see whether the rule being tested, whether it has to do with grammar, usage, or punctuation, is followed by that writer. If it isn't, it is almost certainly a myth rule. Okay, so much for my focus on the sentence. Now, what final words do I have to offer about style? Prose style is determined by an almost infinite number of variables, some a matter of choices and decisions made by the writer, many more beyond the writer's control. Prose style manifests itself at an almost infinite number of levels in our use of language, making it very difficult to use one term to describe phenomena associated with subjects as different as the sentence, the essay, the novel, the writer, the period and culture in which the writer writes, and so on. We can speak of style at the level of the word, at the level of the sentence, at the level of larger prose units such as the paragraph, at the level of the completed piece of prose, at the level of a particular writer, at the level of a particular movement embraced by writers, at the level of a particular genre or form of writing, at the level of a century, at the level of a particular nation, and so on. This course has been built on the assumption that some of the basic building blocks of prose style can be examined closely and described precisely, particularly as those building blocks or moves appear at the level of the sentence. The best attempt I know of to consider all the factors that determine prose style is that of my colleague and mentor in most things stylistic, Carl Klaus. In his well-known essay, Reflections on Prose Style, which serves to introduce his style in English prose, and has been reprinted in several major collections of essays on style, including, and I never get tired of saying this, the Love and Pain Anthology, Contemporary Essays on Style, Klaus considers the factors that complicate our thinking about style, most obviously the fact that we use this one term to refer to many different aspects of language use, and he works his way through the different approaches to style offered by commentators such as Putnam, author of the famous aphorism, Style is the Man, Chesterfield, Hazlitt, Thoreau, Franklin, Ascham, Burton, Bunyan, and Orwell, whose politics and the English language is quite possibly the most important essay on the subject we have or could ever have. As Klaus contemplates the nature of style, he both complicates and confirms Putnam's claim that style is the man, noting that if style is the man, it is only so in a fairly complicated sense, and it may well be that style is always, to some extent, an invention of the writer, 
a fiction that conceals the man as surely as it reveals him. I should note that Putnam's gender-limiting use of man is itself a reminder of the way style continuously evolves, and Klaus's continuing references to the writer always as a man both reflects the date of his writing, pre-1968, and his need to maintain parallelism with Putnam's famous aphorism. Of course, as Klaus points out, style may also describe the deliberate use of language, the self-conscious process of composing to achieve specific purposes and calculated effects. And, quote, having chosen a purpose, the writer has also chosen a style or has had a style chosen for him, end of quote. He explains, style is formative then. It determines the man as much as he determines it. Most important, Klaus insists on the influential nature of our stylistic heritage. For, as he says, language is the basis of thought, and it follows from this truth that inherited forms of expression will inevitably perpetuate the forms of thought associated with them. Thus, he concludes, the most profound reason for studying prose style is that, quote, when we recognize that it can ultimately shape our beliefs, we assume the responsibility of mastering style, lest we be mastered by it. If from Karl Klaus we get our best explanation of the importance of prose style, it is from Richard Lanham that we get the strongest argument that our characteristic approach to the importance of style is horribly wrong-headed. In one of the most radical, most enjoyable, and most compelling educational polemics I have ever read, Lanham charges in his 1974 book, Style, an anti-textbook, that not only is our inattention to prose style in most writing classrooms a shame, but our valorization in writing instruction of clarity at the expense of style is nothing less than a disaster. Boiled down to its simplest form, Lanham's eloquent argument is that contemporary writing instruction with its hyperemphasis on clarity drains all the pleasure out of writing. Quote, we pare away all the sense of verbal play, of self-satisfying joy and language, then wonder why American students have a motivation problem and don't want to write. End of quote. As he also argues, prose written without joy can only be read in the same spirit. The pervasive emphasis on clarity, on the simple and direct in American writing instruction, Lanham calls the fallacy of normative prose. All prose style, he says, as taught in most classrooms, cherishes a single goal, and that goal is to disappear. The aim is the same for all, clarity, denotation, conceptual fidelity. The imperative of imperatives in the books, his term for most writing text, is be clear. The best style is the never noticed. Ideally, prose style should, like the state under Marxism, wither away, leaving the plain facts shining unto themselves. As Lanham sums things up, the books do not teach style, they abolish it. To rectify this dismal state of stylistic affairs, Lanham proposes an alternative goal, not clarity, but a self-conscious pleasure in words, arguing that, quote, such self-consciousness is the only stylistic attitude likely to last beyond the classroom, end of quote. Style, Lanham insists, must be taught for and as what it is, a pleasure, a grace, a joy, a delight. Lanham makes some provocative suggestions for how we can bring this self-conscious pleasure into words in, in our writing practice. And what remains one of his most surprising turns in a book full of surprises is a chapter in defense of jargon, which he calls the fun of a special language. Whether we agree or disagree with Lanham's radical and controversial stance, as you might guess, and as you might guess, I love it, every serious student of writing should know this contrarian masterpiece. A perfect companion to Lanham's style and anti-textbook is Winston Weathers's An Alternate Style, Options in Composition, published in 1980. 
This book expands and provides numerous examples for the idea of Grammar B that Weathers first set forth in his freshman English news article, Grammars of Style, New Options in Composition, writing almost as if in direct response to Lanham's critique of joyless writing instruction, Weathers, in the persona of a Professor X, complains, I write for many reasons, to communicate many things, and yet much of what I wish to communicate does not seem to be expressible within the ordinary conventions of composition as I have learned them and mastered them in the long years of my education. What I've been taught to construct is the well-made box. I have been taught to put what I have to say into a container that is always remarkably the same, that in spite of varying decorations keeps to a basically conventional form, a solid bottom, four upright sides, a fine-fitting lid. Indeed, I may be free to put what I have to say in the plain box or in the ornate box, in the large box or in the small box, in the fragile box or in the sturdy box, but always the box, squarish or rectangular. And I begin to wonder if there isn't somewhere a round box or oval box or tubular box, if somewhere there isn't some sort of container one that will allow me to package what I have to say without trimming my content to fit into a particular compositional mode. Two, that will actually encourage me to discover new things to say because of the very opportunity a newly shaped container gives me. Three, that will be more suitable perhaps to my own mental processes. And four, that will provide me with a greater rhetorical flexibility allowing me to package what I have to say in more ways than one and thus reach more audiences than one. Urging us to be alert to emerging options and to participate in creating options that do not yet exist, but which would be beneficial if they did, Professor X called for, calls for writing instruction that identifies or creates more stylistic options, quote, in all areas, in vocabulary, usage, sentence forms, dictional levels, paragraph types, ways of organizing material into whole compositions, options in all that we mean by style, end of quote. Professor X suggests that these new options would constitute an entirely new grammar of style, many of the features of which are already in use in not only experimental writing, but also in our more mundane efforts but are usually not recognized and are almost never approved of by conventional writing instruction. Against the established rules petrified in what Lanham referred to as the books, rules that Professor X dubs Grammar A, he proposes that we recognize and when appropriate, embrace an alternate Grammar B, whose characteristics of variegation, synchronicity, discontinuity, ambiguity, and the like. This would be an alternate grammar, no longer an experiment, but a mature grammar used by competent writers and offering students of writing a well-tested set of options that added to the traditional grammar of style will give them a much more flexible voice, a much greater communication capacity, a much greater opportunity to put into effective language all the things they have to say. The idea of a grammar B emerged coterminously with the innovations of the new journalism and with some of the experiments of metafiction. I don't have time to describe all of the major characteristics of grammar B, but three are of particular relevance to us. From Tom Wolfe's introduction of and then codifications of the techniques of new journalism, grammar B borrowed the notion of the crot, a short, somewhat paragraph-like chunk of prose that functioned more like a stanza in poetry. The crot, as described by Professor X, can range from one to 20 or even 30 sentences and is a new unit of prose organization, quote, fundamentally an autonomous unit characterized by the absence of any transitional devices that might relate it to preceding or subsequent crots. And because of this independent and discrete nature of crots, they create a general effect of metastasis in rhetoric, the quick dismissal or passing over of an issue, used in this context to suggest 
rapid transition from one point of view to another. As Tom Wolfe explained the crot, in the hands of a writer who really understands the device, it will have you make cra making crazy leaps of logic, leaps you never dreamed of before. Now, both Wolf's and Professor X's explanation of the crot, although made some 20 years before the Internet, strike me as nearly perfect descriptions of the units of prose we have already become used to on web pages, a reminder that a grammar C for electronic text may already be developing beyond grammar B. A second intriguing feature of grammar B is what Professor X terms the labyrinthine sentence, and the sentence fragment. We've already discussed labyrinthine sentences, which I called master sentences, and sentence fragments really don't need any further description. Professor X uses an example given from John Barth to help illustrate the third feature of Grammar B, I want to mention, double voice. The example is from Barth's Lost in the Funhouse, and it's a self-reflexive and metacritical commentary on the text which interrupts the description of a character's thoughts represented by italics with a brief tutorial on manuscript, um, on manuscript preparation. And Weathers lists several other techniques for achieving this double voice effect. Not only has meta-commentary of this form become a norm in postmodern fiction and nonfiction alike, but also, once again, can easily be achieved and regularly is by now familiar web page devices such as the hot link or mouse over animation of selected pieces of text. Other primary characteristics of Grammar B, such as repetition, repetends, refrains, the list, collage, montage, and synchronicity, would also seem to have obvious analogs in electronic textuality. And indeed, Grammar B did a marvelous job of anticipating many of the features we now take for granted when we surf the web or when we suffer through interminable PowerPoint presentations. Having come out from behind the persona of Professor X, Weathers ends his initial description of Grammar B with a passionate plea. Even if we believe our commitment to the traditional grammar is so strong that we must give our full time to teaching it, we should at least acknowledge the alternate grammar say something about it, point out its existence. Even if we exclude it from our daily work in the classroom, even if we say to the student, we can't deal with such matters here and tell him he must wait before he can try such things, we will at least have been honest with him and not left him with the impression that traditional grammar is all there is. We can at least avoid in our profession the conspiracy of silence that is tantamount to restriction and suppression. In these lectures, I hope I've introduced both a number of practical approaches to crafting more effective and more enjoyable sentences. I hope I've also been able to touch on some of the fascinating issues involved in understanding how our sentences fit into the larger concerns of prose style. Oddly enough, both formal and informal references to prose style frequently form an implicit balance, some approaching style as a problem, some approaching style as a gift. We've seen how Richard Lanham responds to the construction of prose style as a problem. Now I'd like to offer a very, very brief gloss on the construction of style as a gift. In a primer for teaching style, published in the May 1974 College Composition and Communication, Richard Graves, now Professor Emeritus of Curriculum and Teaching at Auburn, describes style as, quote, a way of finding and explaining what is true. I love that description, and I completely agree with Graves when he adds that the purpose of style is not to impress, but to express. Looking at style, as Graves does, is an important first step toward thinking of style not as a gift that some writers have, something they can show off, but as a gift that they can give away by passing the truth of their style and the expression of their selves along to readers. In this sense, style is itself the gift, passed from writer to writer, from writer to reader, age to age, as Lewis Hyde has so brilliantly explained the process of gifting in his The Gift, 
Most indigenous peoples believe that the essence of gift giving is that the gift must remain in motion, that it must keep moving as it is given again and again, passed from hand to hand. In this important sense, style is indeed a gift that keeps on giving, just as it is a gift that can and must be passed along. That is the sense in which I offer this course to you. And if you have found in it anything of value, I hope you will pass it along to others through your writing.